Well, I'm glad you could join us once again for the Midway Baptist Church of Athens, Alabama Adult Sunday School lesson. And uh, it's our prayer that you will uh, receive a blessing from the lesson. Uh, we continue to have Sunday School live each Sunday morning in our admin uh, facility. And uh, that happens at 10 o'clock each Sunday morning. We hope that you'll be able to join us for those sessions. But if not, we continue to record these lessons uh, and place them on YouTube so that you might watch them also available at 10 o'clock each Sunday morning. Uh, then our worship services uh, also uh, here on our campus in the sanctuary at 11 o'clock each Sunday morning. And uh, we have live worship uh, if you're unable to join us live, but we hope that you can. But if you're unable to, we also live stream those worship services at that time and then also record them and place them on YouTube at a later time. Uh, so that you might uh, avail yourself of them in that way. And don't forget, Wednesday nights, uh, Doc Overholt continues to lead us uh, in our study of the tabernacle. We'll hope, we hope that you'll be able to join us for those sessions at 6 p.m. each Wednesday evening. Uh, those are also live streamed at 6 p.m. each Wednesday and also are recorded and placed on YouTube if you're unable to join us for a live session. Uh, we just hope that you'll receive a blessing from uh, all these opportunities of worship and study. Let's open with prayer. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Father, for this time that you've given us uh, where we'll read it and study it. I thank you, Father, uh, above all things for our salvation, Father, and for our Savior. As we celebrate uh, this time of year, his birth, we thank you, Father, for the work that he did on the cross that provided us with eternal life and forgiveness for our sins. Uh, I thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit who will be with us today as we study. Father, that uh, he'll teach us the things that you would have us to know and understand. We pray, Father, that you'd guide our thoughts as we, as we uh, study this lesson. Father, that you'll be pleased and honored and glorified by all that we do and all that we say. I just pray, Father, that you'll bless our time of study for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Our lesson title today is Sought. And uh, our focal passages are going to be from Matthew chapter 2, uh, verses uh, 1 through 12. And this is the lesson for uh, December 26th. About 30 years ago, I managed uh, a training organization for uh, a computer company called Intergraph. Corporation. We had a staff of about 50, and uh, we trained employees from around the world on hardware and software, sales and management. Uh, one of our employees named Jack Smith was located in the Middle East. He was a, a manager uh, in the Middle East with his office in Saudi Arabia. Jack knew that I was a Christian, and uh, one year as he came back for a class, he brought me uh, a box uh that contained uh, Omani frankincense. And you can see that on the box here, if I get it in position for you to read it. But Omani frankincense. You can see on that box that uh, it's being burned in an incense burner. And uh, typically when it was, when incense or frankincense was burned, uh, it, was, it was done on some small charcoal briquettes uh, just to give off uh, a very pleasant odor. Um, but anyway, Jack uh, Jack brought me this frankincense. And uh, when you feel of that, when you feel of the little pieces of frankincense, there's, a, there's a, a piece of it there, if you can see that. And if you look at that, it uh, just looks like a rock. But in fact, what it is, is, uh, is when, a, when a certain kind of tree is wounded, or cut, uh, then the sap runs out of that cut and forms these little uh, nodules. Uh, when you feel of that in your hand, it feels like rosin. And when you smell of it, uh, it actually smells sort of like uh, pine rosin. Uh, but at any rate, uh, uh, you can see that, uh, that this was, was something that was real. Today we're going to look at the account of the wise men, and this was one of the gifts that they uh, that they brought. 
they also brought uh, myrrh and they also brought gold. So uh, just to, just to show you, I brought a I brought a, uh, a gold ring. Uh, that was one of the gifts that they brought. Uh, I didn't Jack didn't bring me any myrrh, but uh, later on I ordered a, a package of uh, of myrrh. Uh, this actually contains frankincense and myrrh. And again, you can you can see inside there that there are uh, some little uh, of these beads where the where the uh, sap is drained and then dried as a result of that. Um, uh, and when we when we think about these these gifts were given uh, typically to royalty. The gold, because it was beautiful and because it was valuable. Frankincense uh, was also valuable. It had the odor of evergreen or resin uh, of a tree called a boswellia tree, uh, part of the balsam family, similar to pine resin, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and it was used for making anointing oil for priests and perfume. Uh, it was also used, uh, frankincense was also used uh, in the tabernacle. If you look at Exodus chapter 30, verses 30 through, uh, 34 through 36, you'll see where that frankincense is mentioned there. Myrrh is also a resin from a different tree, a Kamafara myra, uh, uh, myrrh tree. Uh, and again, uh, it's collected by the resin bleeding out of an injury or wound to the tree where it's cut. Uh, it also was used in anointing oil. It was used uh, in embalming uh, people as well. So this tree uh, that produces myrrh is kind of indigenous to the areas of Somalia, Oman, Yemen, Eritrea, Ethiopia, and parts of Saudi Arabia. Uh, the gold uh, that we talk about uh, really suggests royalty. The frankincense relates to Jesus divinity and the myrrh represents his death and burial these these gifts likely uh, provided the means for mary and joseph to take the baby jesus and leave that area and uh, escape uh, to egypt so today the day after christmas we celebrate the birth of our savior we're going to take a break from our study which has been in ezekiel to learn about the wise men who traveled a great distance uh, to worship Jesus. We'll find that they arrived in a search for Jesus without even knowing his name. Uh, when we think today about what might cause people uh, to search for Jesus, uh, we can think of, of a various number of reasons. Maybe they've heard or read the gospel uh, somehow, either... Uh, uh, either from a Bible or a New Testament that was placed someplace and they were able to pick it up and read it or they've heard uh, part of a sermon or a complete sermon. Uh, maybe they've hit bottom in their lives and they're seeking uh, something that would lift them out of that uh, bottomless pit. Uh, they have met someone who was a Christian, who was joyful and uh, possessed peace and, and joy in their lives and they wanted to possess what that person had. They may have tried lots of things in their lives, but they've found that nothing that they have tried uh, in order to cause them to be satisfied or contented with their lives actually caused that to happen. And they're seeking, uh, they're seeking something. I, I believe that God, when he created us, created a hole in our being uh, that can only be filled by Jesus Christ. And there are other motivations as well. But when we think about what kinds of efforts might make a person uh, uh, try to find him in the U.S., it doesn't take much effort. Uh, we are surrounded by, by the gospel. We're surrounded by uh, gospel that can be obtained through the media. We have uh, many, many churches that a person might be able to attend here because we live in uh, what is often known as the Bible Belt. We may have more than many places, but... Most places in the United States, we would not have difficulty in finding uh, a Christian congregation gathered together to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But in some places in the world, it's not that easy. In some places, people actually take great risk 
in order to learn about Jesus or in order to find Jesus. We're going to find that the wise men were among those that expended a great deal of effort to find Jesus. They were following a star from the east, and uh, that adds significant truth uh, to the coming of, of the Messiah or the Christ child. So as we study today, we're going to find that some people are seeking God and his salvation, and some are not. That'll be in the first two verses of chapter 2 of Matthew. Some people misunderstand the truth of the gospel, while, while others want to silence it. We'll see cases of that in Matthew 2, verses 4 through 8. And Jesus can be found by people who want to worship him, and we'll find that in our last uh, focal scripture passage that'll take us through verse 12. So we're going to look first at how some people are seeking God and his salvation, and some people are not. We're going to be reading Matthew <clears throat> chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 3. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So we find that they were following the star uh, in the east. That means they were in the east when they saw the star. It doesn't mean the star was in the eastern sky because they probably uh, were in uh, they probably were in this part of the world maybe in Babylonia, maybe in Arabia. We, we're going to talk about that later. And so when the star shone, it was east of, uh, I'm sorry, west of them, but they were in the east when they actually saw it. So they saw the star while they lived in the east and they traveled west. Um, so we, we uh, talk about seeking God in these passages. The wise men certainly were seeking him. And when we think about who was not seeking God in this passage, we know that, uh, or not seeking the Christ child, uh, Herod certainly was not seeking that until he was motivated by, uh, by these wise men. Uh, we're going to discuss later that the chief priests and the scribes weren't really seeking him either. Uh, we know that the wise men were. They really didn't have a complete understanding of who this was, they referred to him as the king of the Jews. Uh, we don't know where the wise men came from. As I mentioned, some believe that they that they came from Babylon. So if we look at Babylonia, they could have come from uh, this area. Uh, no early Christian writers suggest that, but but many possible many scholars today believe that that's possible. Some believe that it was it was a result of Persia, you know, that Babylonia uh, ultimately was conquered by the Persians and that these wise men were actually Persians. Uh, they had had expectations of the Messiah coming from the Jews who may not have returned from the exile when they had the opportunity to in 538 B.C. And so these uh, men may have been exposed to scriptures that foretold the coming of this Messiah. Uh, some believe it was in Arabia. Some believe it was down in this area, uh, the, near the or below the Arabian Desert, that they were from there. And one of the reasons for this was because of the wisdom of that area that was associated with Solomon's time and uh, uh, the recorded presence uh, in early writers of frankincense and myrrh uh, in the locations that existed in these areas. That's where the trees were that allowed uh, uh, allowed these two incenses uh, to be harvested. So we don't know how many of these wise men there were. A lot of times it, we talk about there being three, but uh, we don't really know how many there were. Three is the number that we come up with because there were three gifts, the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. But I wanted to share with you... Uh, an excerpt from uh, J. Vernon McGee's writing, and I, you know, he always has very interesting things. So I want to just 
to give you uh, his perspective on this. Uh, and I'll quote. First, you will notice that the record doesn't tell us uh, there were three wise men. I don't know how many there were, but I doubt whether there, whether three wise men would have disturbed Herod or have excited Jerusalem. I do believe that 300 men would have done so. These wise men who came from the east evidently came from different areas. They had been studying the stars. When this new star appeared, they joined forces and came to Jerusalem. I don't know how many there were, but I'm almost sure it wasn't three, and I believe 300 would be more nearly true. But please don't say that I said there were 300. So, uh, you know, with a little humor there, uh, J. Vernon McGee believes there were a larger number, and when we look at the scripture, not only was Herod uh, disturbed by these wise men, but it tells that the whole area was disturbed. And uh, his J. Vernon McGee's uh, quote indicates that in order to cause uh, that many people to be disturbed by it or concerned about it, there would have to have been a larger number of people than three. We know from this familiar account that Herod felt threatened uh, by this king of the Jews as the wise men referred to him. They threatened his kingdom. He was, uh, he was paranoid about that. He had already killed a wife, at least one wife. He had killed <clears throat> his sons and he had killed other family members and some of his subjects because of this paranoia that he thought people were seeking to overthrow uh, his reign. Uh, when we think about Today, we might think about why people view Jesus as a threat. Maybe the same reason. In some cases, uh, we would have to admit that that may be the case. Places like North Korea and many of the Middle Eastern countries where God's word is prohibited and uh, people are punished just because they possess a copy of it. So some people today misunderstand the truth of the gospel, while others attempt to silence it. And as we read our next passage, we're going to look at uh, two different types of kings and also who wanted to uh, silence the, the word and who wanted and who may have misunderstood it. So we're going to be looking at uh, Matthew 2, verses 4 through 8. So... And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. So two different types of kings. The wise men were seeking the king of the Jews. Uh, we know if we read about Herod that Herod was not really Jewish. He was known as an Idumean or Idumean, uh, but Herod told the chief, and he was not well respected by the Jewish people that he ruled over. Herod told the chief priests and scribes that, uh, that he was looking for the Messiah. The wise men had said, we're looking for the king of the Jews that was born. Herod interpreted that, and when he talked to these uh, priests and chief, uh, chief priests and scribes, he said he was looking for the Messiah. Messiah can be translated, if we translate it uh, into Greek, as the Christ. Those are synonymous. But literally in Hebrew, uh, Messiah means God's anointed one. And we know that uh, God anointed people for various roles. Uh, God's anointed one in Jesus Christ was the one he anointed who would be the perfect sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sins and to provide us with salvation and eternal life. But it was also used for anointing uh, prophets, and it was used for anointing priests. Uh, those terms, still anointed one, were used in those cases. Uh, 
uh, as well. And, it, you know, we if we remember uh, King Saul and if we remember David, both were anointed by Samuel. So the wise men came to worship uh, one whom God had identified and the way that God had identified him to them was by this supernatural star. We might talk if we have time a little bit about how the star was not a normal star, but that it was a supernatural star. Herod wasted, or I'm sorry, Herod wanted to destroy the Messiah because he believed the Messiah would end his reign over the Jewish people. I thought as I studied about the religious leaders of Israel following this time, who all thought that Jesus would end their religious leadership roles by his coming, and so he was a threat to their supposed good life. The chief priests and the scribes didn't even need to look it up. They didn't need to look up where the Messiah was to be born. They quoted Micah 5 too. But I'd like for us to read that scripture um, as well. It's quoted here in the passage that we read, but I wanted to read it from uh, the book of uh, Micah. Uh, let me turn to that and read it for you. Micah 5 verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from of old, from everlasting. So in Micah, the, the uh, foretelling of the coming of Jesus uh, talks about, talks about the fact that he had existed from before the beginning. Um, and it talks about the fact that he would shepherd the people of Israel. This is different than just ruling. We know that Herod ruled, and uh, Herod, uh, again, was not a very popular king or a ruler, uh, and he, he ruled with an iron hand, and he, was, uh, he suffered from paranoia, uh, he was also a not very, uh, not very compassionate king. But this is Jesus' rule. Ultimately, as a shepherd, uh, would be uh, motivated by his love for the people that he would care for them, as opposed to just ruling them. Uh, a shepherd, in the image of a shepherd, was one who uh, protected the sheep and saved them from danger. Uh, the Messiah, Jesus, would save us from our sins. With this knowledge of Jesus, Herod sent the wise men to find him. Uh, how might knowing Jesus get in the way of seeking him or accepting him? We can mistakenly think that just knowing about him is all that's necessary for salvation. I like lots of detail. I like to delve into the history of, uh, of the New Testament and the Old Testament as well and a, a lot of the uh, prophecy that existed. But I know that I am saved, not because I know about Jesus, but because I know him personally, because I've accepted him as my personal savior, and I, I have asked him to forgive my sins. Uh, and I know that I'm saved because of his sacrifice, because of his blood. We must remember that we're to believe on him and we'll be saved. And we are told that in Acts 1631, the Philippian jailer was told, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And I wanted to read one other excerpt from J. Byrne McGee and probably cause us to take our lesson a little longer than we had planned, but uh, another quote. Um, they knew all about the coming of the Messiah. The problem was that their knowledge was academic rather than vital. It was not personally meaningful to them. They were examples of folk who know the history contained in the Bible, and they know certain factual truths, but these things carry no personal meaning for them. Since the scribes knew the Old Testament scriptures so well, you would have thought that they would have gone to the wise men and said, how about letting us ride down with you? We're looking for the Messiah too. Obviously that did not happen. When we believe we place our trust in him and we repent 
of our sins and we become new people because we're born again. We're born as new people and we honor and we glorify him always for his amazing grace toward us that gave us eternal life through his blood. So Jesus can be found by people who want to worship him, even though it may be very difficult in some parts of the world. uh, He can be found. Listen for how the wise men reacted when they found Jesus. As we read the next passage, Matthew 2, verses 9 through 12. When they heard the king, they departed and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. So if we uh, if we wanted to describe the joy that these wise men had as they um, saw Jesus with his mother, with Mary, uh, we can think about what that might have been like. They were certainly, they were elated. They were overwhelmed. They were amazed. They were overjoyed. And if you think about what you would, how you would compare that, uh, you know, there are various ways that we could see people that express joy. Uh, one of the things as I, as I watch a college football game is, or even professional football game, is how some of the fans react uh, to good plays or a winning, uh, winning of a great ball game uh, by their team, they uh, they almost go crazy. Uh, they get pretty elated by that. These wise men were pretty elated. They were not they were not just calmly saying, "Oh, look at this." They were uh, they were worshiping. They were falling on their faces. They were. Uh, I, I suspect they were crying out. Uh, in the worship of of God. So throughout the Old Testament, God provided uh, signs of the fact that the Messiah was coming. And I wanted to share two of these uh, verses with you. The first one is from Psalm, Psalms, uh, and it's from Psalm 72, verses 10 and 11. And I'll turn there. Psalm 72, verses 10 and 11. The kings of Tarshish and of the isles will bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba will offer gifts. Yes, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. And then the other one is Isaiah uh, chapter 60 and verse 6. Isaiah 60, verse 6. The multitude of camels shall cover your land, and the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall proclaim the praises of the Lord. So we have in in these scriptures, we have uh, being foretold by uh, prophets that, uh, that there would be great worship of the coming of this Messiah. God's plan was very detailed in providing a savior for all people, including uh, the guidance that we need regarding giving as a part of our worship. These uh, wise men gave, they gave in abundance, they gave valuable items to the king. And we uh, can use that as a pattern for our lives. So let's worship him and be overjoyed at his birth, but even more because he gave his life for us and he rose on the third day Uh, in defeat of sin and in defeat of death. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the time of celebration that we have had this year. Uh, And Father, the opportunities we've had to share uh, the good news of the coming of our Savior at his birth. Thank you, Father, for the salvation you provided for us and for this time of reading and studying your word. 
Uh, thank you, Father, that you uh, have blessed our church. And I pray, Father, that we will still be uh, continue to be salt and light in this community. I pray for our pastor, Brother Jerome, as he brings the message to us that you've given to him for us. Father, that we'll have open hearts and minds and that as we leave uh, this place and go out into the world, that we'll be doers of the word, not just those who have heard and forgotten it. I pray, Father, for those who are on our prayer list, those who are uh, sick, Father, those who have other issues in life, that uh, through a touch of your hand, uh, healing and strength and comfort will uh, be given. I pray, Father, for that one that's lost. It's something that might be said or done today. Uh, will cause that person to seek your face, Father, and to seek our Savior, Jesus Christ, and uh, ask for his forgiveness and be born again. Pray, Father, above all, that you'll forgive us for our sins. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us. And until we meet again, uh, may the good Lord bless and keep you.